Um, this is, uh, I mean, I figured if I would ever try and say over this concept, or it's a pretty experiential idea, for lack of a better term, and it's really abstract, and so there are a few Makoros that, like, when I read them, I said, oh, this is the feeling that I had, so I'm going to do my best to explain it, but I figured this would be, like, the, this would be the place to do it. Um, uh, it's not really connected to time or the parsha or anything. Or I mean, it's very Purimdik because the shear of Purim and the experience of Purim, in the Panimi personal experience. But um, so we'll start. Just uh, sorry for all the makoros, but it's the only way I had to really give over the idea because I don't have the words for it. So the first makor is from the Tikkun Zohar. Tikkun Zohar B'derech Klal, the Vilna Gon said, is the secret of music. He said that when the Vilna Gon learned the seven Chachmos, and one of the Chachma was the Chachma of Nigan, he said the only purpose that Jews are supposed to learn the Chachma of Nigan is in order to be able to learn Tikkun Zohar properly. Cause, and that's what he wrote. It's, uh, it's in a Sefer, Olos Eliyahu. Um, and he said that's the secret of the of Moshe Rabbeinu being Kabbal the Torah through Shira V'Tishbacha. And that's how he ends it. So Rabbi Chaim and his Hasagos writes there that um, there's a minhag nowadays to sing the Tikkun Zohar in the Knights of Elul, and he said it's rooted in the fact that the Tikkunim are musical, whatever that means. But so in Tikkun Yidalaf it says, So when Rashbi is speaking about different Hechalim, different palaces, different chambers in Shemayim, so to speak, different chambers in the spiritual ascent towards towards Kedusha. So there's the Heichal, there's the chamber of music, there's the Heichal Hanagina. And the only way to get into that chamber is with Nigun. The only the key to that, just like there's Shari Dama'ash and Alon and Alu that Chazal talk about, the gates of tears, there's also a gate of song. And the only way to enter into that chamber, that holy chamber, is is through song. And the Tikkunim go on to say, begin Da David Meskariv Lahahu Heichalo. David came, David Amelach had a place in that chamber. Deniguna havehu dechsev v'haya kenagin hamanagin. So it was, it was when the the singer began to sing. So that's said about David Melech, and David Melech had the rishus to come into the seichal hanegina through the power of nigun that David Melech had. And Chazal tell us in Shabbos also, and in Brachos, I'm sorry, about David Melech waking up from the kinor. He slept with the kinor of, of eight strings on top of his bed. And the Ruch's phonus would come at night and awaken him so he could get up and sing Shir of the Tishbachos at Chatzos Laila Dafka. So I think at the end of this idea, we'll be able to understand that Gemara a little bit more and the, the theory as to why specifically at the darkest point in the night, at Chatzos Laila, the Hamshacha from the darkness of night to the beginning, beginning rays of light that will eventually come, it's already Nachshav as the next day. Why specifically then David Melech had to be Osek in, in Nigun and in Tvila? Agav, the Piazetzner writes in the back of Tzavaziros, he says, this Heichal Hanagina, even though it seems that only David Melech had Rishos to go there, he says, everybody has, each Jew has a, a chilek of this Heichal Hanagina. And that's a famous line where he says, so if a person sings somebody else's nigun, it's like swallowing their spit. That's the Lashon he says. He said, everyone has to sing their own nigun because they have their shaykhs to the Heichal Hanagina, to this chamber of song. The Jewish soul is, its expression is, is through song and therefore a person who tries to use another Jew's way to express himself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's, it's comparable to swallowing his own spit. So that's the Heichal Hanagina. So I wanted to speak about what, what Nigan is and what exactly not Nigan in the Chitzoni expression that we know of songs and the different manifestations of song and it's innumerable the amounts of different type of music and the cultural music that's there, but really the penimius of the shir, like the Svasama says over here, he says, Shir Hashirim, Yeshlom Hashu Hashir Shabam and Hashirim Hashir Lashlomo. So it's the song that the songs themselves sing, meaning there's the chitzonius of the music, of how we perceive it with our sensual ear, and there's also what the song is saying to us at the same point, what the song is really doing to our soul, and the movements within ourselves as opposed to the external manifestation of it. So, the derech that I'm going to use in explaining the movement of song is the shorish of what music was, especially back before it became what we know as music now, whether it's jam music, whether it's uh, rap, anything. All this music is, is rooted in the essential shorish of nigun that the Torah dictates to us, but at the same point it's not necessarily clear in the types of music that we listen to, and it's more of a 
hargasha that a person would have. And if a person feels it, then they'll know what I what I'm referring to. And if not, then uh, then stam and not. So nigun is always connected to din. The Levim were the ones who sang in the base of Mikdash, and Levi, the Arizal says, based on the Zohar, is always representative of Vulim and Din, because the Kohanim represent Chesed, they, they represent Ohi Shalom, Baruch Shalom, the people who are constantly active in being Makari of Levavos to HaKadosh Baruch and bringing HaKadosh Baruch Hu down to the Levavos of Bnei Israel. The Levim, however, with the Shmira to the Kohanim, the Shmira, they surrounded the Kohanim and they created a Gvul for the Kohanim. Din, in its root form, is limitation. It's the power to make hagvalos. It's the power to create boundaries in order to prevent something from expressing itself too far. So that was the avodah of Levim. And if this is the avodah of Levim, it represents itself in their main nekuda, in the main manifestation of their shoresh, which was nigan. We know that the Levim were always singing in the Levim. The Levim were always osake in the shirim by the karbanos. And that's why the Zohar says in Parshas Pekude that anybody who has a shoresh his Shorosh Neshama from the small, from the left, which really means a Tchunas HaNefesh, a psychological outlook or just inherent character traits that lean more to, not negativity, but being more of an introvert, being more of a silent type who has a difficulty being happy all the time, but rather a person who's more rooted in the realm of limitations and more rooted in the realm of disarray and confusion as opposed to clarity, um, which is represented by chesed. So these souls had a deeper connection to song. And I think that's also why, in, by Bereshus, when seemingly the superfluous psukim are describing the lineage of Cain, we see that specifically Cain's grandkids were the ones who created instruments, and they were the ones who created music, because the, the souls of Cain are the souls of the small, they're the souls of the, the world of disarray, they're the souls of the world of confusion and din and hagvala and machlokas as opposed to the souls of Hevel, which are the souls of chesed, the souls of the right, those souls who are always osake in the binyan of the olam, always working towards perfecting the world and, and trying to be optimistic, as opposed to the souls of Kayan, who are those pessimistic souls, not necessarily pessimism in a depressing way, but just uh, living a, a life of quiet desperation, to, to use a quiet, I don't even know the author. But, um, but those are the souls of Kayan, and specifically through that power came Nigan. That's how song came into the world. Because song, the Arizal says, in the third source over here, he says it in his Sefer Lukute Torah, based on the Pasuk in Tehillim, Atamosho Begavas Hayam. Right? So the Shavach that Dawud Melech gives to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is that he has, he rules over the grandeur of the sea, meaning the sea is an incredible, incredible thing, and it's incredible representation of the powerfulness of nature, but at the same point, HaKadosh Baruch rules over that. So, the Arizal says there, he says, Inyan Hashir, so what is music? Lam Yibisod Agvuros, why is it connected to harshness and limitation? Beside Halavim, like we said, like the Levim who are connected to Din. So, Da, Ki Hinei Soid Hashir, the secret of music, who Soid Beshav Galav Atat Teshavcha. Pasuk says in that Kapitel Tehillim that Beshav Galav, when the waves express themselves and they try and take over, you calm them down. Immediately HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes a gvul and he says, the wave could come up to here, now you have to go back. It's a movement forward and then immediately it's a retraction of its strength. So it has to move right back. So when the lower waves become awake and then they, become to, they begin to try and express themselves, the spiritual waves of Olam Haza, when they go higher and higher in order to express themselves, take Kefata Teshavcham, immediately HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives a gvul to it, and these waves could represent anything, the energies, the, the things we experience in the world. Immediately Hashem says, you have to stop here. But so Butzina de Kardinusa, the secret of the Butzina de Kardinusa. Butzina de Kardinusa is a Lashon from the Zohar HaKadosh and the Ijer but the Arizal really explains it as the, the root of all gurus in the world. Butsina means a flame and Kardinusa means black. It's a, it's a paradoxical dark light which really was placed into creation in order to create limitation. This Butsina de Kardinusa is the Shoresh of all limitation and negativity which we perceive later on with the creations of our physical world. And I've already told you, all the elevated, all the spiritual limitations, 
Butzina de Kardunusa. They all come from this black type of fire. Ki chesed pashe, because the chesed, the mida of chesed is the mida to express oneself, to move outwardly. Ah, ha gvuros noislim kitzvah mida, but immediately the gvuros come and they give a limitation and they say, you have to stop here. The oimr melagal ad poitava below tosif. And they say to those waves that were trying to move outward, you have to stop here and you can't go any further. Upo yashis begon galacha. And over here you'll experience yourself with the grandeur of your waves, but you can't go any further. The amnan kifi bechinas hagalim, but they're different types of waves, which have different limitations, and they could go higher or lower. Humanichem lalos, according to its strength, is how high they could go up. V'yesha oilin madriga alif, and there's certain waves that go up one level before they have to be stopped. V'yeshnaim upiyotze bezeh. And there's other waves who could go higher than that. Vizeso pirke kol hashirim. And that's the secret of musical notes. Oilin v'yordin. They go up and then they come down. They go up and then they come down. Bahavin so gadol hazeh. Nimsa ki kol b'chinas hashir lahalei sakol laharido. Whether it's an expression of the sound of the voice or a degradation of the sound of the voice, hakol al yidei butzina de kardinusa v'sod hagvura. It's only gauged according to the limitations that are placed upon that power and its expressive form. L'chein said hashir gvura, and therefore the secret of shir is gvura. So obviously, these are this is the Arizal speaking, and I can't understand it on what he was referring to. But what I think he's saying is that the tnuah, the motion, and the movement within a person to express itself and then immediately be faced with a blockage to that expression and he has to immediately retreat into himself and then he tries to express himself again and then he has to retreat again because he's being blocked, that expression is blocked by whatever's blocking it, the limitations that he has and that dance, that, that paradox and that dialect the, the dialectic between the movement forward and the movement backwards each according to its own trait is what gives birth to music, is what gives birth to the, the soul expressing itself through song. Because that tension, that, that the stira between ratza of moving forward through chesed, the, the waves expressing themselves, the voice and the notes going higher, and then being forced back down and going lower is what creates music. And that, it's the concept of dissonance in music. There's, co- there's, there's consonance and dissonance, especially... Especially in classical music, there's a concept of consonance, which is when the notes, and correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but the, when the notes seem to fit together, and then there's dissonance, which is when the notes seem to fight against each other. And, and the dissonance is what creates a lot of the time in the music the, the real expression of the composer, the real expression of the music, because only through the dissonance, only through that, that stira, that, that fight between the expression of the sound and the regression of the sound, is what gives birth to music. And I have a quote here from, actually it's interesting, his name is Roger Kemian, he's a, he's a professor of music at Hebrew University, and he wrote a book, The Universe of Music, which is supposedly like the book. So he says about dissonance, he says it's an unstable tone combination, that's what dissonance is, it's tension demands an onward motion towards a stable chord, meaning every time you're blocked, the music is blocked from expressing itself, so it eventually has to re-express itself. These dissonance chords are active because they're constantly moving backwards and forwards within themselves, and, and they can be considered harsh, and they've expressed pain and grief and conflict. That's the concept, I think, of what the Arizal is saying, that this conflict between expression and repression within the soul is what gives birth to music. So... The Leshem, I have two Makoras from the Leshem over here. The first one is from a Sefer called Hakdam Sharm, the first Sefer he wrote. In the back, there's a Chilak of the Sefer called Shara Ponakadim, where the Leshem gives an overview of a, a certain Sugya in Kabbalah called the Olam Hamalbush, which in Chasidus, and especially Chabad, represents the Sha'ashuim of Hakad, the Sha'ashuim, the, the delight. The delight which manifests itself as an inward movement, if you could say such a thing, by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Before the world was created, there was a movement, that it's going to be a delight for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, meaning the idea of creation was a delight to Hashem. And in order for that, that idea of creation to come into fruition, there had to be this movement of back and forth, and tnuah and his his orus of moving from one place to another in order for there to be expression. Hmm. So Leshem says here, he says, it's a few lines down, he says, eh, yeah, yom yom. like the Pasuk says, it'll be my delight yom yom, meaning those are the 2,000 years. Yom is a 1,000 years, Chazal say, and those are the 2,000 years before Hashem created the world. It's over here. 
Yeah, it's okay. over here. It's a few lines down. Okay. By like the double underline by Shachua. Shene'etz la bo'ai de ha The world is created through the strength of delight, through this movement of the Shachua. Shene'etzgale b'bechina Shachua va'al yedei zeh ne'etz la that Hashem revealed Himself through this concept of the Sha'ashua, of this delightful movement, and through that He revealed Himself. So now go to that space, and we'll jump that space, and we'll start from there. This Sha'ashua, and this is the best way I would, I mean, I felt that this is the, this spoke to the idea I'm trying to give over. This Bechina of Hesorus, that excitement and that inspiration we have within ourselves, is a tnua, is a movement, but it's still internal. It's a movement from one place to another in the soul. Shemit nonea ba'atzmo, it moves back and forth within itself. Chol tnua hari hi bechinas kimutz. And every movement at first has to come with a gathering of strength, meaning when a person is trying to quench his muscle in his arm, he has to be miskaber all the strength of his body into that place. And then when he wants to do it in another place, so there has to be a gathering of all the strengths there. And that relationship, there was a gathering of strength in one place and then a gathering of strength of another place, that was the movement from one place to another. And it's from makom le makom, it's from one place to another. ki the movement that's within this midah of delight, meaning this movement comes from a positive place, it comes from the need to express oneself. But at the same point it has to stop and then go, and stop and go. So he bechinas tzimtzum me'atzma la'atzma, the Lashem says. It's the only way to describe it is a contraction of oneself towards another place within oneself. And it's when we feel that we can't express ourselves this way, so I'll try and go back into myself and learn another way of expression. And once that expression is deemed unworthy, so I have to move back and retreat back into myself and then try and express myself another way. The dialectic between those two different motions, that ruts of the show, the running and returning, gives birth to what we know as music. It gives birth to, to, to points of sound, to points of emotion and expression that when they're strung together, they create what we know as song, as Ruda's song, those different kohos, and that's what we see in song. In song, it's the discrepancy between a high note and a low note, a high note and a low note. That's what creates, at least in its primordial form, musical notes. That's what creates the what's unexpressible in words, but it's the struggle, it's the tension between the soul expressing itself and then realizing the inability to express and the need to retreat and regress and repress itself. And then immediately to gather its strength again and be hoylech mechayel chayel to try again. And through that pressure, through that, I know I'm reiterating it, but that's the the purpose of this chabur is more of a it's more of the feeling of this. It's not really a sheer. It's just to to realize the the movement within, especially in the gunim, of just his notes. It says ha'oros, and once those, eventually the friction of the movement. I'm just paraphrasing this lesson. The friction of the movements creates sparks. I mean, just like we see in our physical universe, when when friction is strong enough, moving back and forth, back and forth, it creates heat, and that heat gives birth to sparks, and those sparks gather together and create points of light, the Lashem says. And those points of light gather themselves together with another distant point of light, which was a different expression of the soul. And those musical notes that are born out of that eventually gather together and create gullum of sound, they create waves of sound and light. And through that, is strung together what we know as music. So... He says it, the Leshem says it, um, I think, much clearer in the, in the second Makor of the Leshem, which is in Sefer Hadeya and Chilak Aleph, which is the, really the magnum opus of the Leshem, Shavu Vachalom, it's like a thousand pages. Um, and it's on the first line, he says, V'chol hisorus, all hisorus, all ex- excitement, hinehu b'havchamas t'nua, it's only gauged according to movement. Shekochos ha-seichel, that the powers of the intellect, the kochos ha for the physical strength the person has, heim mis-eirim u mis-noeim v'chol t'nua hu b'chinas ha-ataka shene-atak mikoach al-koach. These powers, these individual strengths that we have are mis-oer, they're awoken u mis-noeim, and they move back and forth, back and forth. The chol t'nua and all movement, hine hu b'chinas ha-ataka, it's only expressed through leaving one place, shene-atak koach mikoach, that my focus of my strength is living this place and going to another place and then back and back and forth and back and forth and eventually until we have massive expressions of energy massive expressions of strength 
שכוחוס הסייכה לו הגוף מסוענים, האכל מחברו, they're removing themselves from one another, ומתגל הריבויים, and they're revealed in their myriad of ways, ומתלהטים זה בזה, and they start to shine forth on one another, and this creates the, the different sounds, if you will. ומאירים לחוץ, and they express themselves outwardly, ונעשה מזה פעולה חדשה, and through that inner movement, that all takes place before anything is ever expressed in the physical universe. Before any expression of ourselves could come out, before the music can come out, there has to be that, that fight, that machlokas, that experience of back and forth, that machlokas, that hisnonin, that hisnonin us from one place to another. If it's a pu'ula masis or pu'ula sikhlis, whether it's intellectual or physical, shehu leidas metzias haskalasa mechudash, this is true in any birth of anything new. The hari nimsa shekol zeh hunehu rak metchunas ha-gevuros, which is what the Arizal said, that this is only through gevura, because gevura is what tells something to stop and move to the other place. If I'm only expressing myself through positivity and, and motion, so I'm never going to stop, and everything will just be one straight line of expression. Only through gevura, only through that... The limitation I place upon myself is what's going to give birth to the next note. Because only through Gevura comes all movement. All Gevura gives birth to the revelation of things externally. But Chesed is different. It's the Midah of Chesed is to be Miyachi, things together, like Ava, to connect, not to create disarray. Chesed, on the other hand, is quiet and it's relaxed and it's b'menucha and it expresses itself on everything. There's no, there's no dialectic when chesed is representing itself, when the midah of, of pure joy is there. That's what chesed is. Chesed is when everything is at one and there's an amorphous blob of the personality, for lack of a better term. Then Cain, hari ein giloy mimenu Right? With chesed, there's no expression to the other because it's all internal. You can't, there's nothing to give birth to. Ki ino yotze shem pu'ula mimenu. Because nothing could give birth, could be born out of chesed. There needs to be that blockage. Ve'en giloy loy klap. Ve'zehu ma shenimsa nizkar ala chesed, Lashem says. And this is why we find so many times by chesed, Lashem chesed pashet. We say there's a simple chesed. Because chesed is always simple. There's no, there's no distinction within the chesed. It's all one bland expression. V'lo nimsa lashon zeh gvura. But we don't find this by gvura, lomer gvura pshuta. Because gvura is the opposite of pshuta. Gvura can't be simple. It's always that relationship between the two strengths <coughs> which will eventually give birth to something. That's why the music, that's why this expression that comes from this battle, this war within a person, is dafka through the koach of gvura. It's dafka through the koach of levim. Because a person needs to have that ability to say, Ad kan tavo, this, this expression can only come towards here, and then I have to retreat back into myself and express something else. And if there's only unity, so there's no music. That's why shir has to, shir is melash on yashar, it's the same osios as yashar, because yashar is when there's a hierarchy. It's when one thing is higher than the other, and the other thing is lower than the other. But the straight line, in contradistinction to a circle, a circle is complete equality. There's no music when it comes to a circle. A circle, there's no difference and there's no, there's no way to express anything different. Everybody is equal. So there's shivoy, there's complete shivoy. So there's no music there. Sheer, I think, has to be yashar. It has to come from a hierarchy of strengths and the relationship between the two of those. I mean, I don't know if this, you know, this is all my... Uh, Shir is like the most complex thing. Like chesed, you're saying, is very partial. Like you do something good. Your, 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 your personality grows as a result of chesed. Shir is much more, it's like a multiplicity of notes and everything. It's like chords and there's right and there's left and there's chesed and gavura and there's like, you know, there's all kinds of balances and everything that you have to take, in, take into account when you're playing music. And it's like very... It's like a lot of, like you're saying, there's a lot of kochos involved. It's not just do something good. You really have to put a lot of, it takes a lot of mastery and it takes a lot of right. competence. What, what I'm, yeah, but I'm talking about the, on the, on the soul level, on the shorish level, what's going on within ourselves? What's taking place when we're, when we're trying to express ourselves? A person, when, when everything is bechesed, a person can express an idea very clearly without facing any limitation towards it, without any 
gimgum or bilbul of his of his ideas. When when a person's in a place of chesed and mochen de godless and an elevated form of consciousness, it's very easy to express an idea very plainly and bluntly without facing any internal battle with it. But when a person is in a place of katnas, when a person is in a place of limited seichel, where he's undergoing an inner battle of expression of the soul versus the the silence of the soul, I think born out of that tension is what what gave birth originally to the to the DNA of music, to the original sounds of music. And the original sounds of nigan. Yeah, of nigan. I'm not. Yeah, and that nigan is more of a. It's more of a soulful. Or the blue. I mean, I think the blues expresses this more than anything else. That's what I think. Or classical music already, which we'll see. The Nazir talks about what exactly is taking place in classical music, because when a person listens to classical music. You could feel more than ever. There's the dun 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 dun. It goes lower and lower and lower, and the feeling of depression and darkness. And all of a sudden, like when I meet Sarkarasika, all of a sudden I'm free from the boundaries of darkness and the lowly sounds and the deep sounds of the music, and I'm all I'm thrown right away to the the celestial sounds of like cherubic music, and then I'm thrown back down. It's like the kafa kela. It's a slingshot back and forth from the elyonim to the tachtonim, and that. That struggle, that intense, intense stira of Yerid Dan Aliyah, of Ratz of Ashov, is what I think creates at least this form of music. And it expresses itself in the lyrics. I mean, this is not, lyrics don't express this. Lyrics is more of a, more of a, a chesed idea. It's where a person can actually give over an idea. The music becomes secondary. Um, but in the blues, at least, the lyrics have taken on the representation of, the, of what lies behind the music of just expressing struggle and right. there's excitement and there's mm -hmm. sadness and there's talking about struggle and there's talking about redemption from struggle. I don't think you, you see, I mean, I don't, at least in my opinion, you don't see it in like current music at least, but a nigun I think is where it expresses itself most. And at the end, I have two examples which I'll, I'll really just read of, of tzaddikim, of two tzaddikim who really express song in, in this way. I think in classical music, no one moves when they're listening to it. Everyone's just sitting down stoically. Right. You know? So you're saying it's like the opposite of this? Well, no, I just, I, I think it's interesting. Right, Because no. it is very dramatic, but right. at yeah. the same time, everyone's like, just The Admor and Sari in, 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 in yeah. Sefer Hespalus. I mean, there's Hespalus Aguf and Hespalus Hanefesh. The mm -hmm. Admor and Sari, this would be his palus hanefesh. It's an internal movement of the soul. I mean, when ah. it's expressed externally, it's already, it's no longer taking place within the person. That's why he went so crazy about people who, who even moved when they died. And that's the whole machlokas between him and Rav Aaron Halevi is chavrusa. I mean, he felt that any external representation of religious <coughs> expression kind of limits or depletes it of its actual hmm. intensity taking place within. So yeah, I, I mean the Kutzker, the Shem Shmuel says the Kutzker, he daven once b'cheder p'nima with the Kutzker on Yom Kippur and he said the Kutzker didn't move. And it's not to say he wasn't be, but they say this about the Rebbe Roshav. After the Rebbe Roshav went to Freud, um, there was a, the Rebbe writes this in Roshimos, but um, he went to Freud to discuss, at least what the Rebbe writes is to discuss his inability to, to write with his right hand. But um, I don't know where you I read You thought that was a psychological problem? Yeah, back then. Mm -hmm. But I also, but I, I read from a Chabad source also that it was that, um, that he felt he couldn't live up to the Admar Maharaj's expectations of, of Rabbanus. So when he went to Freud, so Freud's reaction was that he should remove himself a little bit from the scene of Hasidim and, and not be a leader for a little bit. So the Rebbe Yashab used to travel to, to places further away and he would really just sit there and learn or play chess. Mm -hmm. I just saw a letter in, in Sefer Atchilas from the Sodi Sharm of Atchilas. Um, so there's a mikhtab between the two of them, the Rebbe Yashab and the Sodi Sharm. And the Rebbe Yashab writes to him, he says, I was just in the aquarium in Berlin and uh, I think I saw the snail you were talking about. So like the Rebbe Yashab wasn't, he was chilling in Berlin. <laughs> Yeah, um, but so Mendela Vorka, you know, he would just sit there all night, right, for his tish. He wouldn't say anything. Oh, he wouldn't sing anything. Just sat there. Yeah. So when so, the yeah. Rabbi Roshab would sit in these batei midrashim, mm -hmm. and, and the story goes that like there were even chabad chasid, not chabad chasid, and there were like gera chasidim who were like laughing at him, who didn't ha like they thought he was just uh, everyone was going crazy davening, and he was not moving at all. So they thought he was an amaretz, but chabad more than anyone, and I think the nigunim express it more than any other chasidic is that it's a it's a hispalus hanefesh. It's an internal striving and 
an expression of the soul and the and the movements of the soul as opposed to externally. <coughs> um, this isn't to say I don't think that music is a depressing, just pessimistic experience. Uh, the Ramchal over here on the second page. And his Sefer Adir Maron, it's the second Taylor that came out a little bit ago. Oh. It's printed in the same one now. Oh. But, um, so, four words in. Um, I mean, the words can do a lot, lot better than I can, so I'll read it. Merov Batisha. So this experience, he's also referring to what the Leshem was referring to, This the original source of creation was this... Um, internal, internal movement back and forth, which eventually expressed itself in sparks, which created osios, which eventually created the world. So Merov HaBetisha, from the... Betisha is the, the smacking, the, the... Collision? Yeah, the collision between those those two different kohos, Hayu HaOros Misravchim, the Oros, again, these energies, these galim, whatever, however you want to understand it, they they express themselves and they and they moved outwards and mislahatim b'chol hamiluyim. That's the only way they can express themselves from their from their state of potential. It's only through this relationship of being smacked by a contradictory power, and then that just like we have in chavrusashim, you have the the thesis, you have the antithesis, and then you have a synthesis. But only through the opposing idea, after we express our own idea, can we eventually really really express the idea in its fullest form. And all the different connections these different lights made. And this is where the simcha of the oros are. The simcha, which is rooted in gavura, the real source of simcha. The hiskabras hakoach of a person is the root of his simcha. It's the expression of shlemus. Right? That only is born out of the, the back and forth collision of the two of them. I mean, he's saying it beferish. This is the secret of the song of Torah. When the lights shine forth, they start to hit one another. And there's that relationship, that machlokas between them. And this is the secret of the nigunim of the celestial creatures that are. It's always running and returning, expression and repression. From Bnei Yisrael were Bnei the godless, and they had a ha'ar of these oros in, in their full form. So there was real a power of simcha, not an external simcha of of being happy with what we have or being happy with the the religious or the social economic status, but real simcha of shleimus. But when the, the lights stopped revealing themselves and stopped expressing themselves in their full form. There's no longer a relationship or a, a dialectic conversation between the different forms of Or. And this is what it says in Shmuel Aleph, This is what happened. Before Shaul had the Ruach Ra, the Oros were and there was Or. They were hitting back and forth with one another. So, what happened when he fell into sadness because the oros weren't shining forth and hitting each other? So David Melech had to come and sing for him because through the Kalach of Nigan is Ms. Or, this relationship between the oros again. The Ha'inyan ki metlahatim nishar sisam gadol Because when the oros are not expressing themselves through that relationship, there's sadness. Zebachin Shaul, and that's what happened to Shaul, and he needed... <coughs> A Yodea Nigan, somebody who really knew the power of Nigan to awaken those Oros again. He didn't want to be happy. He wanted to have expression. He needed his soul to be awoken again. So, this Makor, this next Makor, I think is it's really, really awesome. I think it's really, really awesome. So, the whole the Nazir was all Bina. The Nazir was all about hearing. The Nazir felt that Judaism was not a philosophical religion of sight and, and intellectual proofs that a person can see, but rather it was an experiential Ruach HaKodesh, Nevuah type of religion that expressed itself through an inner level of hearing. And it's all he writes about, hearing. He said, I heard Hashem today. I heard the internal voice of Hashem today. And Ad Kedekach, that Rav Ar Nuchensin, when writing a, a review, if you will, on the Sefer, of Kol HaNivua, which won like all these secular awards also in Eretz Yisrael. He said that according to the Nazir HaKadosh, 
any time a Jew sits down and reads a Dafa Gemara, he's experiencing Nevoah. He's partaking in the prophetic experience of hearing the voice of God from within himself. So the Nazir's thing was all about hearing, and he studied music. And the story goes that when he was in Switzerland, um, he was he learned in Volazhen a little bit. Um, and I'm not sure if he was always from after he left Volazhen, but um, before he was in Nazir, and there are pictures of him when he was in Switzerland, and they're awesome. He had like this very short black beard, and he wore like a top hat. He was the cool, like with a pipe, he was very cool. <coughs> um, but he was up one night in Switzerland, and Rav Cook, when he got stuck in Europe um, during World War One, so he was traveling around, and he came to Basel, Switzerland, and the Nazir had heard of him, so he went <coughs> to an inn where Maran Harav was staying, and he said that the Ashmura Saboker, and it's, this is brought in the beginning of Oros HaKodesh, the Nazir put Oros HaKodesh together, um, he said that he heard Rav Cook singing the Akedah before davening, and he said, that's all he did. He heard Rav Kook singing from like one of the walls of the Akedah. And um, he said, I'm going, I, found my, I found my thing in life. I'm going back with Entire Tisrael. And he said he referred to that as like the Mahapecha Hagadola Bechayev. He referred to that as the turning point of his life. It was just hearing Rav Kook singing. So whatever, whatever Rav Kook listened to, he had a power of nigan. He had a power to awaken within the Nazir. And the Nazir eventually became a Taman Mufak and a co of Shashiva of Merkaz Arav and the Nazir Kaddish. So he writes this in the back of his Sefer, Kol <clears throat> and he says, Habina HaTahora, purified understanding, Shimisi, it's an audio experience, a person hears something, Kshura Behechlet Lakol, it's always connected to, to, to voice, to, to hearing something, HaMeshukhrar Mikol Tochen Sir Hanira, that's free from any concept of expression through sight, Kibbenigan, like we have by a nigan. There's no audio aspect of a nigan, but rather it's completely unconnected to the audio, the, the, the visual world of limitation. Ha nigan ha absoluti, a real nigan, an absolute nigan, kulo ikus tahora. It's all ikus tahora as opposed to kamas, as opposed to quantity or mahus or, or what exactly it is. It's just ikus, it is. That's basically, he's saying it is. There's no other way to express the nigan except the fact that it is. There's no, there's no content to a nigan. There's nothing it's trying to say to us. There's nothing we could see. There's nothing that can fill it. And there's no, there's no idea connected to it. The symphony that is rooted in the highest level of, of, of musical theory it brings with it an intellectual questioning in its greatest depths. That moves forward, meaning that the question gets stronger and stronger, and then it's answered. Check yourself. The Ninth Symphony. There's questioning, and then there's an answer. Meaning it goes low, and then it gets higher, and, and, and the question of the lowness is answered. There's a kash and then there's a terah. It's osha ila v'tshuva. We're questioning and answering. I Meaning again, this dialectic between these two interconnecting powers. Acha she'ila v'tshuva heim ikius tahoyrus. That they just are. There's no actual question or answer. It's just the the idea, the power of a question and an answer. Hanigun eno mevia she'ila v'tshuva zu. It doesn't bring a specific question. You dua. It doesn't bring a question that we're really asking ourselves. It doesn't tell us what the question is and what the answer is. It's just there. There's a questioning and there's an answering. There's an elevation and a degradation. The tochen is not known. There's no idea behind it. It's unlimited and it's, it's close to nothingness. It's close to an unexplainable idea. It's not limited to the to the chokim to the to the limitations of of graspability. Min hayesh. It's not from the yesh. It's not from something that exists. Kamoit selim ha'amnus, like art, which is visual. Art is visual. It's something that we could grasp. It's something that we could explain. We could speak about the meaning behind it. Ela kulo chiddush. But a nigun, there's no meaning behind the nigun. It's kulo chiddush, bria. It, it, it's a creation. Yesh me'ayin, me'ruach ha'ein, ha'ikus ha'tahora, ha'kshur el ha'kol. So, yeah, that's awesome, I think. Yeah. I think that's really awesome. Um, last Makor. 
is what exactly, because nigun is rooted in gvura, is rooted in the movement and the expression of the soul that takes place specifically from the power of din that was placed in the world, the root of all din, which is not negativity or death or war or hunger or anything that we see manifested through din in our lowly world of, of the physical universe, but rather in its elevated source, the, the DNA of din that Hashem put into the creation is like we saw from the Arizal, the Kardinusa, the power of Hagvala, the original power of limitation. So through realizing this, through realizing that all din is really rooted in, in the need to limit, which is really the only way we can exist, because Barov or without limitations, there's no possibility of Achirim, there's no possibility of Makablim. We, the Tikkunim, when Hashem was metaking the Olam, a Tikkun is always a Kli, it's always a vessel, it's always something that limits the expression of light, and it comes to that power of Gvura, that's the root of all Gvuras. And as they manifest themselves down here with all the negativity that we can speak about, and there's no lack of it, all it is is just a, a shadow or array of the original, original source of Bura. So when we say, Hamtaka Sadinim Bisharasham, that the only way to sweeten judgments, to fix judgments, is in their source, it means when you look at judgment down here and all negativity down here, and you look and you bring it back to its source, and you say, Where is this really coming from? It's rooted in. Hashem's hatava of the need to create nivra'im through Hagvala, not that this not that this fixes anything for us on a psychological or, or physical level, but the idea itself is is the hamtaka. It, it takes place. The sweetening takes place. It doesn't mean we don't suffer anymore, but the sweetening takes place when we realize the shorish of all of all the gvuros. So this last makor is from Rav Moshe David Viali, who was the Tamun Mufak of the Ramchal. He was a doctor who lived in Padua. Um, wrote Svarim on Tanakh, every Sefer, but also um, Darshan to everything. Speaks a lot about Jesus and, and Christianity and Arabs and the different physical and spiritual sources they have and like really crazy, crazy things. Um, so um, this is brought down in his Sefer Halikutim and Chilak Beis. He says, The time that David Amelech was Osek Tamid Bishiri Zimra, why David always partook in song? So the Pasuk says, Zmiros Hayuchu Kecha Bebeis Megurai. That Zmiros were my, what I really did, Bebeis Mugurai. Zmiros Kapshuta Mamash. really means he was singing. Ki Ashir Vahazemer Moshe Chesag Vuros Mesharashem. When we're experiencing song and, and Nigun and Zmiros, what we're really doing is we're bringing down the power of Din from their Shoresh to express itself in that limitation. Mimenu Nichbin Vinichnoim Hadinim Hatzmeyim. And through bringing down that elevated place, that Shoresh of Din, we our nichna, we, our mavata, the dinam hatmeim, the, the unpure din that represents itself in the physical universe. Besoid haklal hayadua, right, the known idea, she'en hadin nichba el b'sharasho, that dinam down here are only sweetened through realizing the shorash of it. V'yini zehu hatam she'ayad David ha-melech ala shalom oisek tamid b'shir e'zim rab melechas ha-nigun. And this is why David ha-melech was always osek in melechas ha-nigun, why he spent his whole life in song, trying to express his soul, the, the yearnings and the Expressions of his soul through song begin to ihu achid b'hay darga tata sharga yardemavas because David Amelech represents the physical expression of reality where the legs are dangling into death where death is very real and negativity is very real and din is very real down here and in order to sweeten that ukadei lahachniyo l'shaber as tokef hachitzaynim in order to negate the power and the actuality that we give to all these negative powers we experience in our lives he always had to actively participate in song because song represents going up to the shorash of dinim to the patina de kadimusa and bringing it back down and the science of nigun for the same reason <coughs> like we started off with Nigun and the power of song is rooted in the Levium. It's rooted from the Tzad HaGavur for this exact reason, because only through Nigun, only through recognizing that real Din is limitation in order to express itself, in order to create that dialectic and that machlokas between the two contradictory terms. And without the Gavur, there would have been no expression of that and there wouldn't have been an expression of reality, which is the biggest shir. And the Olam is always singing out a shira. So, I think that 
that takes place when a person, at least the, the times where we experience the Shalashudas, Shalashudas is really the time a person feels this with the lights off, where there's no, there's no vision, where, where the visual Chachma is turned off, and all a person has left is the, the audio aspect of himself, and that Tanua that takes place, and if you felt it, you felt it, if not, then not, but um, that movement, for lack of a better term, that battle, within ourselves, and P.S. Etzner explains it on very psychological terms, he says like, do I sing, do I not sing, like, should I express myself here, or should I not, do I do a somersault, do I not do a somersault by Shal Shodas, he has an incredible, uh, he goes back and forth within himself as to whether he wants to express himself externally through song or not, um, and at least for me it's like, at least in Eretz Yisrael, was my eyes closed, like, is that eyes closed, like, how do I, how do I look when I'm singing this nigun? That expression, in a very small, small way, represents what's taking place during a nigun. Um, to end, yeah, time's good? Yeah. yeah. Um, to end, so, I, I want to read this just because I found this a while ago online, before Hill Zeitlin got really, uh, really popular, and like, in my excitement, I brought it, I ran to Rav Weimarder with it, um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I've seen that, like, <laughs> there's nothing the man, anything that took place in the Tukufa of the Holocaust, at least, there's nothing the man hasn't seen or, or knows, but, um, it's from a Breslov website, or a Berdichev, it's about visiting Berdichev, it's like a, it's like a tourism website for Berdichev, so it's a translation of Hillel Zeitlin's experience on a, on a, on a Shabbos afternoon in Berdichev, is everyone cool if I read it? Yeah? yeah, yeah. Who is Hillel Zeitlin? Hillel Zeitlin was the most interesting man. Hillel Zeitlin grew up in Chabad Hasidus. He says for the first two, 13 years of his life he lived in ecstasy, in, in ecstasy of cleaving to God, in like a hispomenos that only Chabad knows, of living on the level of Yichad Ilah and going back to Yichad Tata. And he was learning from a Talmud of the Tzemach, a Talmud of the Rebbe Rashab was his like, his mentor. And um, at the age of 13, um, became disheartened about something, he was always, always searching, and he went everywhere, he went to communism, he went to journalism, he went to socialism, he went to poetry, he was like best friends with um, Brenner and all these different guys, and even when he became from again, he still, he was masked with these people, and he remained friends with them, he was a journalist, um, he tried everything to fix Kali to, to fix what had happened to Hasidism, to fix what had happened to the Jews. Eventually, before the war, very strangely, he was Ms. Orer himself, um, really like Begeder Navi, he was going around from town to town um, explaining like in the late in the late 20s that like we need to do tshuva, uh, like a, sh uh, a Shoah is coming. He was telling different communities that that Jews were going to be under very harsh din. Um, some people thought he was crazy. And if you see, he's a very cute, he was like a little man with a very long beard and all, he was sitting at like a park bench, it was really cool. Um, and he was murdered um, by the Nazis on a train deck that was going towards Treblinka because he, he was Miss Aura people. He gave a speech that's written in this really intense art school book called The Unbreakable Spirit. Like, they no holds barred in this book, it's very good for Tisha B'Av. like they tell the most intense stories um, and they have this speech written down an unbreakable spirit it's like a small old um, art scroll book it's it's really rough really rough so they have his speech in the back and um, he was order the jews to like kill as many nazis as possible um, and he was killed holding his wearing a talus and holding a zohar um someone just uh what's his name yeah uh who just translated Oh, um, Arthur Green. Green. Arthur yeah. Green. His book was just translated by Western and spiritual classics, like a lot of his writings. Um, he was really, really awesome. And he's like the father of like neo Hasidism and, and like, but he's really from and he's ours. He's not, a, he's not theirs. Um, so, the first expression of song that he's going to explain is generally how we think of like Hasidic and Yigunim, and then when he comes to Breslov, you, you'll. I think this is what the Chaburu was all about. So he says, If a visitor to Berdichev wishes to hear a typical Jewish melody, let him listen to Rabbi Nissan Belzer's protege. If it is Berdichev or Hasidic song he desires, he should go to the Karliner Shtibel. When the Holy Shabbos departs, and the Berdichev or week arrives with its barrenness and its darkness and destitution, the Karliner Hasidim are still aflame. Their ecstasy has just begun, and they don't even dream of bidding farewell to the Shabbos Queen. 
I heard their singing from afar one Motzei Shabbos and couldn't detect even a hint of sorrow. Now they are sitting in the palace of the Divine Presence. How can they bother themselves with hunger and pain, poverty and gloom? To be sure, each of them has his own bundle of suffering at home. To be sure, these burdens are difficult to bear. To be sure, many have aging daughters to marry off, bills and rent and tuition to pay, and an empty money box to cover all expenses. If God so decrees, he must attempt to heal wife and child, and one is himself a bit sick. Old age encroaches, one's strength begins to fade, the world is stricken, and there is no sustenance. Tear yourself apart, but what will you accomplish? One sits at the king's table, when the Holy One, blessed be he, is present, there is no room for worry. We Jews have a God who lives forever. The merit of Shabbos will stand by us. The old Karlina Rebbe is surely a good advocate over them. Besides, why worry when we know that everything our Father does is for the good? Even when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Are with me. However, if you would like to hear an altogether different sort of melody, if you would like to hear a melody born of the deepest and most difficult sorrow, if one would like to see ecstasy, which is not the result of emotionalism or fervor, but only of the most profound, lucid knowledge, if one would like to see how men can actually walk upon the earth and yet not be here, let him forbear to traverse the muddy bridge of our streets, let him cling to the crooked alleyways, let him pass by the ancient cemetery, the broad, desolate field where the night shadows fall on orphaned hills, and where one lonely leafless tree at the edge of the meadow can bring one to tears. Afterwards, let him pass the so-called Lebedig shul, the shul nearest the old graveyard. Let him pass by many other such shuls. Let him absorb the Jewish dejection and the special melancholy which can only be felt in Jewish settlements, where the divinity of Shabbos is about to bar depart from her children, and dark reality peers out with her lackluster eyes. Let him then betake himself of the shtibel of the Bresselor Hasidim, let him bring along his own broken spirit, let him prop himself up in a dark corner and hear sigh after sigh from the breast of the Hasidim, who sit around the table listening to those Rebbe's teachings. Let him feel in their sighs an expression of the speaker's words, such a yearning for God that is unbearable. Let him listen well to what is being said. Let him not trouble himself that this is the, or that interpretation of scripture is not so smooth or tidy or may be open to various objections. Let him hear the main point. Let him hear the tenor of the words, the greatest of simplicity that emerges with the greatest wisdom, the most profound insights mentioned in passing without any indication that here whole worlds have been laid bare, gradually touching upon everything that exists on earth and raising it up to the heavens. Let him feel here the cosmic pathos which after the moment of inner liberation must be transformed to cosmic joy. Let him feel that here hovers the spirit of the great Rebbe or Benachman of Breslau, who lifts men up from the darkest depths of hell to the highest everlasting light. Let him later observe how silently, one by one, the Hasidim leave the table, join hands, form a circle, and begin to dance. In this dance, not one awkward move can be detected. For every turn, every gesture, every inclination has been refined, ennobled, sanctified to the lostliest level. You look, but you cannot believe your eyes. They seem to be ordinary people, simple Jews, not great scholars, perhaps not scholars at all. They look like common laborers and porters. Yet such inwardness, depth of feeling, and clarity of insight, such spirituality in every gesture, every footstep, and every note of song is impossible to find elsewhere. All the days of my childhood were spent amongst Hasidim, and in my life I have had occasion to hear and see various kinds of Hasidic singing and dancing, including some exceptional melodies from the old Chabad Hasidim. But I never heard or saw anything equal to what I experienced in the poorly lit, forlorn shtibel of the Breslover Hasidim in Berdichev. Their joy is true joy, and their song is a song of redemption. They are free men. Say what you will, these people particularly when amongst themselves are no longer in exile. They are always at home in godliness. Outwardly they may seem less impressive than other Hasidim. One who has an eye to glimpse what is going on within the next fellow to God must be astounded by the honest, wholesome rejoicing of these people when through the dance they talk. As we whisper the breast as we approach the breast of Ashul, my companion, whose sympathies do not lie with the Hasidim, whispers, Here we must walk more quietly. His observation is appropriate. A certain quiet holiness rests upon the shtibel. Quiet is the sigh, yet it splits the heavens. Quiet is the discourse, yet it penetrates to the depths. Quiet is the dance, but through it you seem to be carried away in spite of yourself to other worlds. Quiet is the melody which suffuses your very being. Everything is quiet, everywhere. Aside from the Hasidim, a number of Jews come here off the street. They come by chance or out of curiosity. Not always innocent of penchant for laughter or scorn. It all remains quiet here. Everyone must listen. By his own choice or otherwise, the scoffer will be a scoffer no more. He must become sincere. 
This in itself testifies to the power of the spirit. That which is noble and strong must overcome that which is base and inferior. During his exposition, the speaker remarks, the Jewish people must teach all the nations that there is a God in the world. One of the scoffers come over to me and, mom, and murmurs, he means that the Gentiles should attend his sermons. A little later, I see that the very same scoffer watching everything with an expression of utter seriousness. He doesn't care to laugh anymore. As the dance becomes especially beautiful and joyous, I observe a 14-year-old boy, one, one of the curious, tells his friend, it would be so good if all Jews could be this happy with their faith. Indeed, it would be so good, my child, so good. So I think that's, I mean, no words, you know, but that's what a niggin is. Yeah, shkayach.